together, give a big AFO welcome to Stephen Bloom and Mary Elizabeth McGlynn! This is a general question and answer session. So that means you ask the questions, they do the answers. We tried it the other way, it didn't work out so well. Yeah. So um, I'm gonna be running around with a microphone uh, so you guys can answer your, ask your questions to the microphone. Now keep in mind, for those of you who've never worked with a microphone before, uh, if you whisper in a microphone, it's gonna sound like this. And we're not gonna we won't be able to hear you. We won't be able to hear it. So we wanna hear you. Microphones are magic. So, even though you've got a microphone, please speak if so Steve and Mary can hear you. Um, a couple of points I want to make. Uh, this is a Q&A. Please keep in mind, keep it questions and answers. Um, I'd like to challenge the audience to come up with a question. These guys have done hundreds of anime conventions. <laughs> Maybe more. Yeah. And I would like to challenge you guys to come up with some questions they haven't heard before. I want you guys to make these guys think. I want you guys to make. No. What? <laughs> I don't want to think. think. It's Friday. They promise no thinking here. New stuff. It's in my contract that I don't have to think. Um, no okay. thinking and we no math. We check that out. All right, we're gonna check that. But <laughs> <laughs> with that being said, uh, what I want you to do is raise your hand when you have a question. I will find the next person. I'll bring the microphone over while they're answering the previous question. So uh, with that being said, Steve, Mary, is there any intro you guys want to give yourselves? Larry Furry, ladies and gentlemen. Larry, <laughs> we love you, Larry. We've known Larry for a long time, and we still like him after yeah. all these years. Uh, I know. He yeah. took us to Universal this morning, and I am the voice director for She-Ra, and I completely forgot that She-Ra was a, a walkable, walk-aroundable character. So Larry's like, oh, let's just stay here until 2. I was like, I don't know. we got to get back. i got to shower. I'm all sweaty and everything. He goes, just hang out. And I heard these young women going, there she is. And I was like, there who is? <gasps> and I just burst into tears because there was She-Ra walking around the corner. And you guys are so lucky that you just have her here. She's here. And she's, she's real. And she's real. So tell the folks who you are and what you do. Okay, hi everybody. Uh, I'm Mary Elizabeth McGlynn. I'm a NASA nerd, so I'm very jealous of you all. You get to see all those uh, rockets going up. I was here a month ago and I got to watch the Falcon Heavy go up at NASA. So if you are interested in NASA or space or watching rockets go up, I highly recommend going on to, my mic is getting quieter and quieter, uh, NASA, dot org forward slash social and they've got these things called NASA social events that you can go to and watch rockets go up and you get a whole weekend of science we got to meet all the as a drafter would say science oh uh, we got to meet all the uh, um scientists that were putting up the new atomic clock and this new green propulsion system it's really cool I'm also a voice director and uh, I'm currently directing She-Ra and Tangled and uh, a new show coming up Dragons uh, Rescue Riders for Netflix and all kinds of other shows. And then I am a voice actor. I'm currently doing Coach Brunt on Carmen San Diego. Welcome to Vile Training Academy for Thieves. Uh, and Steven Universe. And in terms of anime, I've done a lot. I directed Naruto for 10 years. I directed Digimon. Uh, I directed Wolf's Train. My first directing job was Cowboy Bebop. Uh, I so what? fell in love with Spike that I had to play Julia, regardless of if she sounded like this or not, I was going to play her. Uh, because I was so in love with your voice as Spike. Oh. Now I'm so in love with him as Steve. Oh. And we are engaged and stuff. And so yeah. Spike and Julia have a happy yeah. yeah. Which is pretty awesome. So if you have ever wondered whether or not they lived, they lived. They lived. They live in oh. us. Oh, oh. oh. Uh, and just a couple more things. Uh, Ghost in the Shell, I played Major Motoko Kusanagi for a long time. I'm in Naruto. I do like 10 roles in Naruto because we're like, we gotta deliver an episode. Well, I'll just hop in the booth. How often can Kiba's mom come around? Turns out she came around a lot. Uh, <laughs> who knew? And I also am the singer uh, for Silent Hill. So I've done all those Silent Hill songs for all those years, if you're into that at all. And that's me and my story. It's a pretty good story. It's a good story. And, uh, I'm Steve Bloom. I've been doing this for about 30 years. I started an anime on a little show called The Giver and just never stopped. I did it for fun and it somehow turned into a, a lifelong profession. It uh, wasn't even a job for many years. I just did it on the weekends for fun while I worked at a film studio. 
And when I became an executive at the studio, I realized that I hated going to work every day, and the only thing I really liked was still going to work on anime uh, on nights and the weekends. It's the only thing that really made me happy. And uh, getting to know this community also made me really happy, because I realized there were some really nice people in the world. They weren't all nasty like they are in Hollywood. Um, so I, I just stayed with it for <laughs> so many hours. Oh, it's, it's me. It's just it me. Um, but I, I ultimately made the transition into video games. Uh, some, my first video game was called Full Throttle for LucasArts. And uh, you remember that? Oh my god, amazing. Uh, and, I, and I stayed in the video game community too. Did a lot of uh, video games for LucasArts, which became Lucasfilm ultimately. And then transitioned into uh, original animation. And so most recently, uh, I've been on Star Wars Rebels as Zebradios, mm -hmm. uh, Starscream from Transformers Prime. Uh, I've worked on Tangled with Mary Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. as, Star Wars Resistance. Yeah, Star Wars Resistance. Yep. And uh, man, so many other things. Wolverine. Uh, Wolverine. Yeah, lots of Wolverine for a lot of years, Bob. Um, so that's been pretty good. And still, Tom is Tunam, Tom, as Tom on Toonami, I don't have my Florida mouth yet. Uh, hey, <laughs> Toonami Faithful right there. Woo! Sweet. Yeah. Um, so after all these years, uh, every Saturday night, only Toonami on Adult Swim. Um, yeah, so still get to do that all the time. And in video games, I'm still doing a lot of video games, most of them I can't talk about. Uh, but probably best known as Grunt from Mass Effect and uh, Take Dempsey from Call of Duty. Uh, and then I've made the transition into films recently. So I started uh, working on films a, a few years ago, and I've been in uh, Rogue One and Solo. Shazam! And Shazam recently, Incredibles 2, and Bumblebee, lots of, lots of movies. Critters. And Critters, yeah, for you Critters fans, we just did Critters Attack, and I did all the Critters in that, so. Which isn't Critical Role, it's something very different. No, completely different, so. yeah. Just lots of <laughs> and eating people and chewing on legs and things. So. <laughs> so that's my story. But we want to hear what's on your mind. So if, do we have the microphone ready? Yeah, yeah. We do? Okay. Let's so who's got a question? Up. Raise your hand. All right. I'll start off right here with the Godzilla Shirty guy in the front row. <laughs> what's your name? What's your question? Um, Adrian, I got one question. Um, why in Rochimaru became a, a world ninja after he betrayed the lead village in Naruto? Because the writers told him to. <laughs> <laughs> you have the answer for that. Um, I, I think Orochimaru never really fit in, uh, even though he was one of the legendary Sanin, it was obvious that he his was a, a darker path than Jiraiya and Tsunade, mm -hmm. uh, but eventually he came around, you know, I just think that he needed to go down a lot of different paths before he finally came back around to where he is in Boruto right now, and one of those was becoming a rogue ninja. And now I'm a daddy. <laughs> <laughs> he makes them in his lab. Yes, I do, as all good children should be made. <laughs> I'm kidding. Don't try that at home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right, next question. Um, I'm going to ask going forward, uh, if, when you have a question, stand up, because Steve and Mary want to be able to see you too. So stand up, what's your name, what's your question? Hi, my name is Ashley. Um, hey, Ashley. Thank you so much for coming to AFO. Thanks for having so, us. So, um, this question is for Mary. Um, so, I've done a lot of voice acting, but I would also like to, um, I'm very curious as to, um, like, how to get into voice directing and yeah. ADR directing. Like, I would like to know, like, what it is you do besides, obviously, directing the voice actors in the studio. Like, what other duties and responsibilities are with that? Well, sometimes with voice directing, it also involves casting, which can be a lot of fun. It can also be very time consuming, and I'm directing eight shows right now, so it's really hard for me to find the time to be able to do the casting as well. Uh, but that also means that I can bring in people that I can rely on, that I love to work with, and that I know can really start at this level and we can go up from there as opposed to bringing somebody up to that level. But I'm always open to, we just taught a class the other night, uh, Thursday night actually, before we got on the plane to come here, uh, to find new people. And that's also something that I want to start doing more and more to really get more people into the industry because the industry is changing so much. First of all, good on you for wanting to be a voice director, being a female, because it's the one industry, it's the one part of the industry that has, I think, more female directors than male directors, or it's pretty even. Uh, for some reason, they embrace us, and there's really no uh, 
sexism involved in that, at least not that I have experienced, maybe once, but that's it. Uh, and two, the industry is going to the internet, as we all know it was, and you guys are probably all on it now anyway with YouTube and everything else, but now the studios are realizing that's where the future lies, and that's in streaming. So you've got all these apps, Disney Now, Disney Go, Netflix, DreamWorks, everybody's gonna start doing, uh, and so there's going to be so much content because everybody wants to be the king of streaming or queen of streaming. So uh, you're in a really good position, a great time to get into this industry because there's going to be so much content right now. So, 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 so much content. So uh, does that kind of answer your question? Yeah. yeah. What it's, is, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say one of the things that Mary didn't mention in terms of the responsibilities of the director that I think is sometimes overlooked by actors because we walk in, we're the star in that moment, but the director actually has to know the entire story. That She spends every night marking up scripts and, and, and parsing it out for the individual actors as they come in to be able to hold context for us, and that's a huge job right there. Yeah. It's, it's an amazing job that I think is very underrated, and the sessions can go really, really well or really, really uh, with a lot of difficulty if the director isn't prepared. So that's just something to think about when you're considering becoming a director. It requires a lot of reading, a lot of breakdown of things without enough information sometimes. Yeah. Exactly. You really have to know that stuff. And if you don't, sometimes it comes in at the very last second. She's struggling sometimes to get that information. But she is still the one who has to hold it all together and also be the translator between the producers and owners of the property to the actor on the other side. And there's a lot of translation that has to happen because many times they don't know how to talk to actors. Yeah. So it, it really is a, it's a um, translation job as well as anything else too. And every director has their own style. I find that I'm most successful with actors when I don't try to impose my style onto them. I'll adapt to their acting style. Every actor has a key, every single one, and everyone responds to different things. So if I'm directing, you know, Timothy Dalton and he says, does this really need to be this loud? And I'll be like, oh, I know he's done Shakespeare. I'm like, yeah, this is a blow winds and crack your cheeks moment. And, oh, all right, <laughs> let's do it, you know. But somebody else might just be like, you know, this is a, you're going to need a bigger boat moment. Oh, got it, you know. And some people are, are, so you can tell that every actor responds to different things. And it's really your job to be an instant detective and figure out what that actor is going to respond to uh, and implement it. So you've got to gauge that really, really quickly. So you sort of become an instant acting psychologist or psychiatrist. Yeah. For me, she'll just say louder and suck less. Yeah, suck less. <laughs> Could you just try it again in any form that's good? <laughs> yeah. so a little more do. talent on the next take. Yeah, Maybe just a little, a little less fiddle, a little more talent. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, question. but you'll start to, gr to create a language with each actor, um, and everyone is different, and that's the challenge of it, but that's also the fun. So. Great, great question, by the way. Yeah. All right, next question. What's your name? What's your question? Uh, my name is Wyatt. Uh, Hi, Wyatt. Cowboy Rule was a gateway for me when I was growing up. Uh, in your own words, I you asked for uh, simple questions, but in your own words, what do you feel deserves a reboot or a continuation for both of you? Which shows? Yeah. Oh, oh, Ghost in the Shell. Oh, they're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait. oh, wait, they're doing that. Uh, for me, Megas XLR. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wish we did. I wish we did. We were just hitting our stride with that show. If you guys are familiar with it, or if you aren't, look it up. It was, it was a love letter to the anime industry and to giant robots and action cartoons and everything that all of us love. And uh, the network just didn't know what to do with it at the time. And we were just kind of hitting our stride when it kind of was pulled out from under us. And also Wolverine and the X-Men for me. Uh, yes. We were yes. just at the point where we were gonna go into the Age of Apocalypse and they pulled the plug on that one. A lot of really, really great shows stopped before their time. Spectacular Spider-Man too. Mm -hmm. yeah. For me, it's not an anime necessarily, but thanks to Critical Role, I love Dungeons and Dragons. And when I was Woo. a kid, I loved the animated series. Dungeons and Dragons. Looking at it now, it is so cheesy, but I loved it. I loved it, and I really wish that they would do an animated series based on, it doesn't have to be Uni and, and the gang from uh, from that particular show, but I would love to see, oh, they are, Critical Role, that's right. But, uh, let's, but for that specific, 
Yeah, I'll shut up, because, yeah. <laughs> Dandy. Dandy beyond. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's all we got. Next question. What's your name? What's your question? Uh, my name is Ricardo. Hey, Ricardo. I've been a huge fan of you for many years, and I've also been a huge fan of Transformers. Oh, yes. thank you. You have excellent taste. <laughs> so I've been wondering, because I know you voice a lot of them, is there any particular one that you have more fun with? Like uh, Shockwave, Swindle, Truck Shot, or of course Starscream. It's Starscream every time. Uh, Starscream is just so much fun for me. I love doing everything and anything in the Transformers universe. I, I just love Transformers. It's, it's such a fun franchise. But getting to voice Starscream was one of the highlights of my whole career. And part of that had to do with working with Peter Cullen or Frank Welker, Optimus and Megatron, in that same room. And it was a room, it was like the star-studded room of, uh, it was a who's who of some of the best voice actors in, in the industry and in the world. And all of us would sit and become uh, fangirling eight-year-olds every time either one of them opened their mouth. And they were friends for like 40 years uh, prior to that. And, and they would go into these little comedy routines. Both of them were, were sketch comedians and improv, improv artists and impressionists. And they would go into a routine, and there was a lot of money being spent on that show, and everyone just shut it down. All the suits on the other side of the glass would just stop what they're doing if these two went into a little comedy bit with them, and we just go like this. <laughs> oh my god, it's Optimus and Megatron doing comedy. This is so cool. <laughs> so for that, and for so many other reasons, uh, Starscream is my favorite. The, the one other quick thing that I'll share with you is that uh, Starscream wasn't originally written to have as many girly scream moments as he did. He started out very dark, ripping the spark out of Cliff Jumper. They wanted him to be kind of ferocious, and of course he was going to go into that sniveling place. But they enjoyed it when I screamed so much, they loved torturing me so much, that they actually wrote a lot more of that. <laughs> uh, to the point where the suits, and we had a lot of people from Hasbro who would attend those sessions. It's kind of unusual that a lot of the industry uh, suits would be there. But they had a code for when they wanted me to really go up into the high Chris Lotta screaming territory, and it was basically jazz hands. So there's nothing funnier than seeing a bunch of dudes in suits from a studio going like this, behind, silently behind the glass. And so I knew that I had to go from here to, ah! <laughs> uh, so yeah, it was just super fun on every level. Thank you for watching, and don't tell Megatron we had this conversation. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right, next question. Stand up, so they two. What's your name? What's your question? Hi, my name is Paul. This is a question for Steve. Um, as somebody who, uh, who regularly watches Toonami, how often do you have to re-record Tom's voices? Because I know, like, you know, new shows come on and new shows go, but like, I feel like they would reuse a lot of the um, voice recordings instead of having to make you come in and uh, re-record a lot of stuff. <laughs> you would actually be surprised. I record Tom at least once a week from my home studio, which is nice. I get to record from home. Um, thank you for whoever's clapping for home studios. Uh, just so you know, usually I'm not wearing pants, so sorry. If I'm, I'm kidding, I'm not. I'm not kidding that I'm kidding. Um, I record every week, and sometimes uh, we do have to record more than once a week. This week I had an emergency session uh, late in the afternoon, I think it was Wednesday or Thursday, something like that, and I was rushing to something else. I had to stop everything I was doing and run to my studio and get it done. But I can't even tell you how many times I said, only Toonami. We do it every single time uh, as a fresh new uh, piece of copy, unless they have something that they can really repurpose it without all the other stuff. But we have so much new programming happening all the time. And as you know, we change the time of the programming too, depending on what we've got for that week or that month. So I'm constantly recording and constantly updating. So it, I have to make sure that I can still do the voice all the time. But it's good, it keeps everything fresh that way, I think. Thanks for watching, Toonami. You still stay up late? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> cool. <laughs> nice, nice. Apologize to your parents for me if I got you in trouble when you were younger, when you should have been doing your homework. Yeah. <laughs> All right, cool. All right, stand up. What's your name, what's your question? My name is Steve. I have a question for the both of y'all. Like, what's the proudest moment in your career and what's something that you wish you had done in your career? Ooh. Ooh, good question. Wow. Um, getting through directing Sam Jackson without freaking out was pretty awesome. <laughs> uh, we all screamed like little girls at the end of that session, uh, and that was really, really fun. What I'm most proud of. Um, wow. I'll take that one first. Yeah. 
The proudest moment, I think, isn't really even doing the work itself, it's what comes after the work. Uh, coming to these conventions and having conversations with you guys, uh, some of the stories that you have told us have changed us on a cellular level. We had no idea that you guys were even going to pay attention or even watch some of these shows that we did. And uh, I, I had somebody contact me yesterday or the day before about Cowboy Bebop and how the show got this guy through a really, really dark time in his life to the point where he wasn't sure if he wanted to go on. And Bebop is one of those things that helped lift him up and keep him going. And now he's successful, he's in a relationship, he was able to, to really pull himself out of that dark place, having that show as sort of a companion for him through those dark times. So that is the proudest thing for me, that the work that we've done has actually helped you guys through tough stuff. And, and as far as what I haven't done, I, I've been so lucky you know, to get to do this at all. I don't have any regrets at all, except maybe I, I wish I would have uh, studied singing when I was younger, because now I am singing and it's really hard. <laughs> I'm singing on a lot of kid shows and uh, I realize how difficult it is. And, and living with a professional singer, it's I'm in awe of that ability all the time. It's, <laughs> it's so amazing. So I wish I had studied that more when I was younger, when I had a chance. Yeah, we're, the one really wonderful thing about being able to do this is that there are a lot of kids, uh, we get a lot of requests for Make-A-Wish kids, and they come to the studio and we just have this unbelievable experience and to see that light in someone's eyes when they meet Miley Flanagan or they meet us and it's, you know, they come back. Um, used to happen a lot for Naruto, we'd get a lot of Make-A-Wish kids that came in. Um, I remember a lot of people talking about Ghost in the Shell when they were in Afghanistan and they would watch that in between uh, missions and when they had downtime and it sort of got them through it. Uh, and some of the songs from Silent Hill, the letter in particular, people say that that really got them through some awful, awful times. And I know it's gotten me through some awful times too, so I have to thank Akira for writing those incredible songs and Joe Ramirez for the lyrics. Uh, the one thing I wish I could have worked on was I loved Death Note. I loved the Japanese version of Death Note. Loved it. And yeah, it was so good and so dark and so different. And I really was hoping that we would get a chance. I lobbied hard for that show. It went to Canada and they did a great job, but I just, I would have liked to have worked on that. So. But we've been so lucky to, to have worked on what we have, yeah. you know, it's just... Who knew? How can you look at a buffet of everything you've eaten and just be like, I wish I had more cheesecake, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's just, <laughs> we're so lucky. We're so, so lucky. Cool. All right, next question. What's your name? What's your question? All right, my name is Jake, and uh, this is a question for Steve. So, um, Ace Combat is a very near and dear series from my heart, so I was just wondering, um, how, how was it to... Uh, to work on it after such a long pause from five and seven, and uh, how is it, you know, doing such a different role from Captain Bartlett to a high rider? Wow, that's one of those games that I just, I have so little memory of it. Uh, sadly, I'm not a gamer, so I never get to play the games, and when I go into the studio, sometimes I, I don't even know the name of the game that I'm working on. This, uh, this was one of those instances, because everything is top secret. So, I'm, it's so out of context for me, I'd actually have to watch some footage to give you an accurate comment on that. Um, I'm sorry if that disappoints you, but that, that's just the truth. We, we work on so many of these projects in the dark, we just don't know what we're working on. And, and that's intentional. They just don't want us idiots spilling it out there and ruining it for you guys. Because <laughs> we'll come to um, a con and just be like, blah, blah, oh! Yeah, oh, they're not releasing it for six months, oops. Yeah. Um, yeah, and also we, we work a lot too, so sometimes, I think that happened when I recorded that, uh, I was doing probably three sessions a day um, and on a convention tour. And I, last year I did 30 conventions, so it was probably in that mayhem when I, I'm only home for two or three days a week working 14 hour days and just slamming through so many different shows and projects, I don't even know what I'm doing. So now I'm gonna have to go home and I'm gonna have to look up some scenes on YouTube if somebody's posted something. I might have a better answer for you by the end of the weekend. <laughs> but thank you for playing, appreciate it. All right, we went over to this side. Stand up, what's your name, what's your question? Hi, my name is Lynn, and this question is for both of you. Um, obviously, since you guys are engaged and you are in the same industry, how do you guys balance uh, work and, I guess, relationship? Oh. It's actually 
It's surprisingly easy. We it really so is. Well. And we're both so busy that we give each other space when we need it, which I think is the key to any healthy relationship is give the space, but then remember to float in the pool. You know, I mean, it's just there are times when you just need to be still and quiet, but together. Yeah. You know, that's really important to occupy the same space and not talk about work. Just float, you know, which we do. Well, and I think one of the things that really worked for us is we've known each other for 20 years as friends. 21 years, I guess, as friends. And uh, the, our relationship started out of respect. Uh, she was the greatest director I had ever worked with and still is one of the greatest in the world, I think, now. Um, and I get to, it's, it's, it's really true. It's, it's really true, though. I, I work with her fairly frequently still yeah. on, a, on a few shows. And she's just a, an amazing director. We did a class the other night and she was directing some, some pretty high level students. And I hadn't gotten to see her do that in a long time. And I just sat there. I was supposed to be co-directing the class with her. And I, I interjected here and there. But most of the time I was going, wow, that was really good. Oh, wow. That's, I'm writing that down. It is, <laughs> she's just a wealth of information and just a giant heart, too. She, she wants everyone to do well. She uh, is just a big old ball of love. And she's also ferocious. She is... <laughs> Um, you know, intelligent and, and fearless. It's, no. Honest, no, no, I'm pointing um, to what you are, and then she's a fro you said frozen side. Oh, yeah, that's yeah, me. Yeah. And the big ball of heart is all you Yeah, know. yeah. No, I, there are just so many things that I love about her, but she's, she started as my friend first, and we are best friends every day, all day, and we have this shorthand between us, too, that I think has developed just over years of friendship in the professional area and also in the personal area. We've both been in relationships where it was really hard. Uh, communication was really hard and we, we kind of honed our communication skills to the point where, and we're also older now, and uh, we, we're not, we don't need to tolerate the nonsense and the games and the stuff that we had to, I think, when we were younger. And so that shorthand translates really easily into our relationship. And if one of us is going through it, the other one just kind of backs off and lets them do their thing and is just there as a soft place to fall. And uh, it's a, the best partnership I think I could ever ask for. It's amazing. That and separate bathrooms, key to any great relationship. <laughs> yes. And cats. We cats. have two cats. Two well, giant, huge yeah. Main cats. Huge. <laughs> Ash and Bishop, they're gigantic. Oh. Know the movie? Know the reference? Ash and Bishop. Ash and Bishop. Before that was Jones. Jonesy. Oh, alien. Yeah, alien. You know we can hear you scream. Yeah, exactly. <clears throat> yeah, I'm a big alien fan. She's so. a big old nerd. Oh, big old nerd. Yeah. The, the other reason that I love her is that uh, we, we made friends with this company called Sideshow Collectibles. They make these oh, beautiful yeah. collectible figures. Yes, yeah, they're Sideshow. Amazing. We love Sideshow. <laughs> and they gave me this gigantic Wolverine. Huge, beautiful Wolverine piece, and she let me put it on the dining room table. <laughs> I'm a lazy Susan, I thought, okay, I'm keeping it. Yeah. <laughs> and then when she made friends with Sideshow, they gave her this giant alien king statue, and that went on the dining room table also. <laughs> yeah. and so, the, and I've got She-Ra on the island in the kitchen. We give each other weapons for <laughs> yeah. birthdays. Yeah. And, uh, so I gotta say, I'm curious to see what's gonna be uh, the toppers on the wedding cake after hearing about it. Oh my god. <laughs> oh, and we should commission Sideshow for that. Ooh. Ooh. Ooh, that's a good idea. Write, Write that, that down. down. Right now. <laughs> Yes, that would be really amazing. Continue amongst yourselves. I'm literally making that. That's brilliant. Yeah, we're going, to, we're going to build our dream home together in yes. Hawaii, which is just going to be a nerd paradise, pretty Woo! much. So, and it's going to be just everywhere. It's like, oh, look, it's it's a xenomorph. And, uh, and there's Deadpool over there. Mahalo. Aloha. So, so basically what I'm hearing is your dream project is Wolverine versus Aliens. Ooh, yeah. Cool. Like the anime. That would be... Yeah. That'd be pretty good. That'd be pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, Wolverine can handle some of that acid. Yeah. Let's, let's experiment at home. We'll try that. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you guys ready for another question? Sure. Yes. Why not? All right. Uh, what's, what's your name? What's your question? Going down this road. Hi, my name is Jason. Uh, first, thank you for promoting the Space Coast Park in Melbourne. Oh, you are? Yes. If anybody gets a chance to go to KFC, totally worth it. We're going to we're going on Monday. Uh, yeah, fun, Steve awesome. has never been, never been to the space wait. center, uh, and and now that SpaceX is there, you like they have the truck that takes you back to the tour, and you can oh. see all the launch sites and everything. It's pretty cool. Yeah, I did it for uh, the Falcon. Am I dueling out loud? <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it's maybe a difficult. 
difficult question. What are some of your funniest moments you've ever had in voice acting? Oh, <laughs> well, I, it's a story I tell because, uh, you know, uh, okay, I did, um, there's, sometimes you go in and do some games where you just play a character that gets pounded. That's it. You have no lines, no, the only thing you do is either pound or get pounded, right? So it's a lot of, it's just a sound set. So I went in to do Halo and they said, so you are going to be the character that gets beat up on today. And I said, great, so we need a full sound set of just, ah, oh, oh, ah, oh, uh, uh. And so I said, okay. So we've got about 50 of these. I said, okay. I said, and basically you're just parroting the person that just came in and did this. We've got them edited, and if you want, we can just play it for you, and then you can echo it. And I said, yeah, that's really easy. Just run them, and we did. And we got to about, and it turned out that it was Steve that I was parroting. <laughs> so you do the thing, and I'll parrot you back. Just oh. <laughs> and during one of these, I farted. <laughs> Uh, and it was, uh, and, and everybody's, you know, in the studio, everybody's marking stuff off, the engineer's looking down, so everybody's got their heads down, and I'm on the other side of the glass, and I was like, ah! and I just looked up, nobody looked up, and I was like, let's just keep going. So we just kept going, going, did another 15 of them, and then finished it, and I, they, I said, you guys cool? Any pickups? So like, no, that was great. I was like, awesome. I have a fart in Halo. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I call her now. Yes. Uh, I have so many fart stories too, but I'm not going to tell one of those. <laughs> um, We're very gassy. <laughs> yeah, we just do that. But this this one is just wrong because this is an anime convention. I'll tell you an anime story. Um, I was doing some background work on some anime. I don't even remember what it was. Uh, and we had this little booth that we called the refrigerator because it was, it's one of these ISO booths that's comfortable for one person, tight for two people. We had five people in it. Four guys and a girl, and we're all doing these background screaming, some screaming scene. A bunch of people running from some monster, I don't remember what it was. Um, but as we're doing this, I'm in the front of this group, and we're all sort of piled around, we're, we're like this, squished into the group. On the front of the booth is a a uh, big glass wall where the door is. On the other side of the glass door is a monitor so we can see what's going on on the screen. Well, I'm getting ready to go. We hear beep, 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 and all of us just go, ah! And then all of a sudden, I feel a finger go up my butt. <laughs> and, I just go, ah! <laughs> and I hock this giant loogie <laughs> onto, <the, laughs> onto the glass door and just watch it slow. <laughs> right in front of the monitor, and everybody is just dying of laughter. They think it's the funniest thing. And my, the only question I have in my head is, who the hell did that? <laughs> like, two knuckles in. I mean, it was deep. It was <laughs> so... He had pants on. Yeah, <laughs> I had pants on. That session, yes. Um, <laughs> but uh, they had to stop the session because the loogie was on there. Nobody could see the screen. And we, they had to clean it off, and so they have to wheel the monitor away and open the door and let us all out. And we kind of had to breathe anyway because we were dying laughing. And I just wanted to know who had done it. And and uh, this very small woman is in the room with us, and I had never met her before. I kind of knew everybody else in the room, and she's just going <laughs> like this. And I'm thinking, oh no, it can't be. It can't be. And and then I look at the director, this guy named Kevin Seymour. He's one of the the great anime directors uh, of our era and it was his girlfriend and he had set her up to do this and he was and and he has the he had this devious uh sense of humor and he was always very straight up and very uh monotone about everything but when the the joke was revealed he just kind of went <laughs> God, <laughs> and he thought it was the funniest thing in the world, and so did she, and I was just mortified. It was just it's so bad. So. But that's a very Japanese thing, is the, they do that in Naruto oh, yeah. all the time, too, is the old, you know, it's just, yeah. Yeah. I think it was only one finger, I don't think it was two, but I, I don't know. I remember when Naruto what, was two, it's was like a juicy. Yeah. It's, a, it's, a yeah. it's very popular among the in Japan, where they do that. Oh. They do that to each other. Oh, a thousand years of pain. A thousand years of pain. Oh, yeah, it's pretty painful. <laughs> it's, it's been about 22 years of pain so far. So, yeah. so you're almost not there at all. Oh, yeah. <laughs> all right, let's move on. Uh, <laughs> on. 
On that note, what's your name? What's your question? Uh, I'm Mark. I didn't know you guys were engaged. So I'm like, my teenage self is like screaming right now. Yay! But, but, uh, Mine too, dude. My, my question is, uh, what's your, well, what do you guys think is your most underrated character? Like something I could watch, probably that I, have, I probably haven't seen that you think uh, deserves more oh, light to be shined on. Uh, oh, I have one for both of us. Oh, we did great. a show called uh, Wolf's Rain, which is oh. very, yes, and it's a short series, but I loved Lord Darsha and Lady Jagara. I thought that was, those were two really dark, wonderful characters. That one sort of predated Amon in terms of your vocal placement. Yes. Like that one was very much along the lines of where Amon was, I thought. I love, love that show. Yoko Kano, who also did the music for Cowboy Bebop, and I think Ghost in the Shell, yep. uh, in Evangelion, I believe, um, uh, did Wolf's Rain, and it's much more orchestral. For Bebop, it was all jazz and fusion and all this and stuff, but it's very orchestral for Wolf's Rain. It was exquisite, so if you need a short series that you want to see Johnny Young Bosch and um, Crispin Freeman and uh, Kari Walgren, Bob Buckholz, you, me, it was great. Mona Marshall, uh, some wonderful people in there. I think the characters, I can't find it, I was looking it up. Uh, I'm so terrible at that. Uh, there was a uh, Kung Fu Panda show, it's out there now, uh, called Cause of Destiny. Cause of Destiny. <laughs> and I played the bad guy in that, I think it was Jin Dao or something like that. And uh, it was it was such a great show, great writing, and I don't know if anybody ever saw it. And we recorded it super fast. It was one of these things where I wasn't sure how my performance was. Charlie Adler was directing, if you know who Charlie is. And he just, he snapped the performances out of us so quickly, I wasn't sure if I did anything that was even decent at it. And we watched it together, and I loved it. I thought it was... It's some of the best work It was one of the best performances. Done. It was yeah. so good. Yeah, so if you get a chance, watch Kung Fu Panda Paws of Destiny. Season right? one. Yeah. It's just, he plays this yeah, evil was, bird. And I just Boy, wish people had seen it. So, oh. and they made merch. Yeah, check it was out. That, was I right on that character's name? Did, oh, uh, did, oh, you haven't seen it? I haven't seen it. But Has anybody here seen that? <laughs> no, you have. So was yeah. I right on the character's name? Uh, yeah, I see that since the beginning of this march. Um, oh, okay, cool. I watched them all. Yeah, it was, it was pretty awesome. So that would be my character that I think was very underrated. Okay, yeah. cool. All right, we're all the way back here. Stand up. What's your name? What's your question? Hi, my name's Joel, and this is for both of you. Who's your most favorite character you voiced throughout your whole career? Um. Whoever I'm doing on Tuesday, because I'm still working. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still employed. It's so hard. It's so hard to choose because different roles came along at different times in our careers and our lives that influenced that were so influential at the time. Like playing Motoko and Ghost in the Shell was I'd been doing a lot of on camera work and I was always the battered woman and I'm like, why am I playing all these victims? Why am I do I need to be rescued all the time? Can't I play a strong woman? And when I got Motoko, I was like, oh, that's what it's like. And she helped me find my strengths as a woman. It was like, I could be badass and still be feminine or not be if I choose to. So it, it was, that was amazing. And Bebop was fantastic. I mean, Governor Price and Star Wars Rebels, to be a part of the Star Wars universe, there's so many different roles and it's, it's impossible to choose just one, but there are definitely some that were sort of, you know, giant markers in my career that, moved me to a place where I never thought I would be, and those were a few of them. Yeah, my answer is pretty similar to that. Uh, Cowboy Bebop changed my life in every possible way. So, um, thank you, I'm glad to, because I didn't make it. Um, <laughs> now, we were just so lucky to get to work on that show, and, and I, I won't say that that's my favorite character, because I love so many of the characters during uh, the course of my career. But that is the character that led to so many other things. Uh, it, it led to Toonami. I wouldn't be doing Toonami without Cowboy Bebop, Mega Sex LR, uh, so many of the anime that I worked on after that. I even found out that uh, Legend of Korra, so you guys are Korra fans, um, the character of Mon, the reason they brought me in is because they were fans of Cowboy Bebop. I had no idea until we finished recording that series. They told me on the very last day, and they said, by the way, we're big fans. And I was like, what? We just recorded a whole series here. This is amazing. So, 
yeah. the, the fans come out of the woodwork 21 years later and talk about the show as if it was done yesterday. And it's just a, a phenomenal, it's had a phenomenal impact in our lives. And also, I get to be with Julia. I mean, how no. awesome is that? <laughs> what was that? Wedding topper, yeah. Wedding no, topper. No, I wrote it down, dude. I'm, I'm I know. on that. I know. Yeah, Bebop changed my, it was my first directing job. I didn't know what I was doing. And at the time, there was no Adult Swim. There was no internet. There was basically a blockbuster DVD area, you know? And I said, and as we started to work on Bebop, I just thought, it's such a shame that nobody's ever gonna see this because this is the coolest show I have ever worked on and may ever work on. It was brilliant. So we just thought, well, since nobody's gonna see it, I don't know what I'm doing. It's Steve's first leading role. I think Wendy Lee had the most experience out of all of us. Just like, let's just make a show that we enjoy and take this beautiful, perfect thing and not mess it up and make it really adaptable for a westernized audience because mm -hmm. it's kind of who it was made for in the first place. Mm -hmm. And that was it. Yeah, and just on another personal note about Bebop, uh, when we were recording the movie, prior to that I had worked on crazy characters, creatures, monsters, aliens. Uh, Spike was really cool. I was kind of getting used to doing that. That was really terrifying at first. But to actually get vulnerable was the thing I hadn't done before as an actor, and I didn't understand the value of that. And when we were recording the movie, and I had that scene in the jail cell with Elektra, uh, and we were talking about real pain and real personal stuff, I had never let that stuff out in my personal life. And so Mary gently guided me through that process, and that changed me personally and professionally. I realized at, at that age, which I don't even know how old I was at that point, but uh, it was pretty uh, late on. I was a, a definitely a grown-up man, and I was just learning how to be vulnerable for the first time in my life. And so that was life-changing for me, and one of the main reasons that Spike would be one of my favorite characters of all time. Yeah. Cool. It was such an interesting process because, you know, Spike was always cool and had his guard up and everything. And I remember you read it once, and I said, okay, that's cool, Spike. This is open, Spike. Yeah. What? Wait, okay. I don't talk about stuff that really hurts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And so for us to basically step it down and down, like draining a pool slowly, just to sort of very easy, easy, dipping our feet or dipping your feet into what it was like to be so She vulnerable. made me cry, you guys. That's, That's great. great. Just so great. I love making them cry. It's <laughs> fun. Oh my. Oh All my. Right. Oh my. So on that note, uh, stand up. What's your name? What's your question? My name is Paul. Um, what are some of your worst experiences when recording for anything you've been in? <laughs> um. Oh, I got one. Okay, go, go, go. Well, I can tell the one I told in the car yesterday, but it's probably not appropriate. <laughs> you guys can handle it, right? Uh, go for it. Uh, all right, I'll, I'll tell one. Uh, this wasn't as bad as I thought it was when it happened, uh, but I was auditioning for a Spider-Man game. I was auditioning for one of the bad guys, and one of the villains had to scream really loud and really long. And so I was in there and I just went, ah! And at some point I ran out of air and I fainted. I passed out. <laughs> happens to a lot of us, you do a lot of screaming. Uh, but I fainted and uh, I, I was okay. I, I went to the floor. I hit a couple things on the way down. The, the engineer and the director came running in and they were checking on me. And the reason I know all this at the end is because they recorded all of it. <laughs> so you just hear me going, ah! boom, boom. And then a couple seconds go by, you hear the door, ah! the door opens up and they go, are you all right? And you just hear me say, I think I almost just passed out. They said, no dude, you did, you need to go to the hospital. I said, no, I'm good, I'm good. And you can hear them lifting me up and, they put me back up to the microphone and I finished doing the auditions and I booked something on that. Okay, so that's that's the good part. The Steve, bad, tell yes. me that this is available in the outtakes of some DVD collection oh, somewhere. Sure. I, would, I think we'd all love to hear that for real. I don't know, man. But what did happen was two months later, I'm in another studio with another director, completely different unrelated project. And the director says, uh, Steve, before we start, I want to play something for you. Oh. And then I hear the whole thing for the very first time. And I said, how many people have this? Who has been, who's passing this around? Why? So this thing had been, it had been shuffled around throughout the community, apparently, and I was the only one who didn't know, so that, that kind of sucked. 
but it was funny. In retrospect, it's funny now. Uh, I won't tell that story I told in the car. Uh, I'll tell a Naruto story instead. So we live in Southern California. You know what Southern California has? Earthquakes. So we were recording Kakashi Sensei. Dave Wittenberg was in the booth and he was recording something and I don't know, it was like, Naruto, you've got to do this and get in there and, uh, and Sakura and Sasuke and, and all of a sudden, and you could hear it. And I was like, uh, we're having an earthquake. We're having an earthquake, Dave. And this is all recording. Uh, we're having an earthquake. It's like, yep, big one, leaving the building. <laughs> you can hear him say that as he's leaving the building. They left the mic open and everybody ran out of the building. But it was, uh, that was pretty awesome. Sounds fun, actually. No. I just thought of one other one. Um, this one, I don't know if I've even ever told at a con before. I was working on Digimon uh, and I, I do stunt belching for some actors who can't belch sometimes. And uh, yeah, she's a great belcher, you should hear. It's, it's amazing, it's, it's the song that wakes me up every morning. Um, but I wasn't getting the right belch done, so I asked for a soda. I really wanted to growl out a gigantic one, and I asked for a soda, and they, they brought me something awful. And I chugged the entire thing, and I went, all right, I'm ready to go. I just feel rumbling. And I just went, I just started laying out this magnificent belch, and all of a sudden I threw up in my mouth. And it just, and it just filled up the whole thing, and I went, what do I do now? And I swallowed it back and continued burping. It was awful. It was just awful. And then it happened again. During that same session, I, I, I belched again. And after you, know, after you do that, if you drink some soda, the belches are going to come up for the next hour. I try, I, the, for the rest of the hour that I was there, I was actually just recording my net, my regular character, whatever that was, and in the middle of that, every time I would belch a little bit of vomit would come out. And I just continued on. You just soldier on sometimes, so, yeah. Now I, I know why you haven't told that story. Yeah, oh yeah, <laughs> anybody just eat? Sorry. <laughs> Dr. Uh, Pepper! Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, hey guys, uh, I do want to point out that we are running short on time, so we just have time for a couple more questions. But I do want to point that we will be doing autographs in the dealer hall immediately after this panel. So, if any of you guys want to get autographs, photos, anything like that with Steve or Mary, head right over to the dealer hall immediately after this panel. As soon as we're done wrapping up here, we're going to head over there. So, with that being said, next question we got two. This one, stand up. What's your name? What's your question? Hi, uh, my name is Brianna. This question is for Steve. I was just wondering, since you did Mugen and Samurai Shampoo, what was your favorite scene that you did and your worst? Oh man, that's another tough one because I've only seen the first seven episodes. Um, I, I'm so busy going to conventions, every time I start watching it, I get interrupted and then I'm on the road for months and I have to start over again. So I don't really have a favorite moment in that one yet. I'm sure I will once I watch the thing all the way through. But pretty much every time he um, would rather trade somebody's life for dumplings, I thought that was kind of funny. <laughs> uh, and I loved his fighting style just in general. It was just so sloppy and awesome and effective, and it's kind of the way I've run a lot of my life. Um, so I'm gonna have to get back to you on that one. I'm actually gonna have to watch it at some point and, and decide what is my favorite one. It, it, it's, I disappoint myself when I don't get to see these classic shows, especially because the guys who, there are two of the guys who worked on the music for Samurai Champloo who were in town in Los Angeles last week and they did a concert there and I couldn't go. But even if I had, I wouldn't have known the music and that's heartbreaking to me. You know, some, some shows like Bebop I've watched enough and I even listened to the soundtrack in my car. I know the music is amazing for Champloo and I, I need to really get into that show. That's my homework. I'm assigning myself some homework so that I don't disappoint you next time. But thank you for that question. Cool. All right, this is going to be the last question. Stand up. What's your name? What's your question? My name is Alex. This one's for uh, Mary. What was it like going from voicing the major in Standalone Complex to coming back for a rise and voicing a different character? Oh, that was so much fun. We knew when um, Funimation got uh, Ghost in the Shell a rise, which is actually a prequel to uh, everything that I did as the major, they recast everybody in Japan. So a Funimation called and said, just so you know, they've asked us to do the same thing. 
And I said, that's fine. You know, I'm not the only one to play Monteco. I wasn't the first one, certainly. And uh, it's sad. Richard Epgart was really mad. <laughs> and I was like, well, it happens, you know. But then they said, but we've got this other role for you if you want to play her first mentor, which is Kurutsu. And I thought, oh, wow, that is so weird and wacky and wonderful to play a character that's actually talking to a character that I would later become. So I thought that was pretty amazing. And I was very grateful for Funimation for them to, to bring me in on a rise. I think they did a great job. I loved Chris Sabat as Bato, and I thought it was terrific. It was really, really good. So yeah, it was fun. Can I just do a little plug for our class tomorrow? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we're actually going to do like a little mini master class tomorrow if you're interested in voice acting at all. Uh, it's not going to be anything super technical. We're just going to kind of give an overview and just a short version of some stuff that we actually do in town. Um, I have a, a studio called Bloombox Studios, and we actually teach voiceover classes there. We'll have information on that at, our, at my signing table. But Mary has come in as a guest director there, and we've taught a lot of classes together, and we've put together like a mini version of a voiceover master class. So we're doing that tomorrow at 1. Uh, this is main events here, yeah? yeah. Right here. Yeah. So right here, 1 o'clock tomorrow. And then... Uh, and I'd also like to say, even if you're not interested in voice acting, it's a really interesting way, because it is about finding your voice to speak up in our society today. So it's everybody has a voice, a unique voice, and everybody deserves to be heard, and sometimes we don't feel that way. So it's also a way to give you a little more confidence in finding your true voice and being able to express it in your own lives. It doesn't necessarily have to be voiceover. Mm -hmm. And we'll do a little Q&A with that too, and maybe a little surprise in the middle of it. So please come to that tomorrow at one o'clock. <laughs> Shira's coming, you know? Shira's coming. No, she's All right, so we're going to our signing tables now. Hopefully yep. we'll see you guys there, and thank uh, you for coming. Thank you so much really for having really us. It. And thank you to Larry Furry. Thanks, Larry. Once again, guys, at this time, if you want Steve and Mary's autograph, head right out those doors. Take a quick right, head down to the dealer's hall, which is right down the hall. Their table's going to be right inside there. As soon as we're getting done here, we're going to head right down there. So we'll see you guys there.